Happy Friday, everyone! Yes, it's Friday. You have made it through the long week. Whoop! There we go. Question that I want to leave you with going into the weekend is: Why is everybody so sensitive? You know what I mean? It just seems like there's a lot more feelings these days. Plus, I'll be giving my thoughts on Gay Tucker Carlson appearance last night, and I'll be sharing the most insulting video I think that I have ever seen in my life. All that and more today on Candace Owens. So why is everybody so sensitive? You know what I'm talking about? You, you just look around and there are a lot of feelings. Just everybody has a feeling and they want to share that feeling publicly. And I'm looking at these kids going, wow, you are incredibly sensitive. So unlike the generations before us. I always go back to my grandfather, you know, my favorite human being ever. And I think about all that he lived through. My grandfather growing up during the times of segregation, real, actual, social issues that existed in this country, right? Growing up as a child and having to work, forced to work on a sharecropping farm uh, so that his family could eat, right? And yet I never remember my grandfather having all of these feelings. He was never angry about the way that he grew up. In fact, I never saw my grandfather cry, not even on my grandmother's dying day. And they were married from the time that he was 17 years old, 40 some plus years. No tears, a, a true strong patriarch. Today, you just can't even imagine us producing that sort of human being. Everybody is sensitive, even more sensitive than they were when I was growing up. In fact, I was thinking about this. I was thinking about my first day of kindergarten. You're not even going to believe what happened to me. So it was sort of my first time being properly socialized. I didn't go to preschool, and all of the kindergartners did go to preschool. But my first day meeting a bunch of people that I didn't know outside of my family web, um, I remember uh, we went to the playground. It was recess time. And I had met a girl in my classroom. Her name was Susan, and she was introducing me to all of her preschool preschool friends uh, out in out on the playground. And she introduced me to this girl, and her name was Amy. And she said, "Amy, this is my new friend Candace." And Amy looked at me, and she said, "She's ugly," and she ran. She just ran away. And I was so mortified and so heartbroken that I was meeting this girl and she said something so mean to me that I sat on the corner of the playground and I cried. I know. Can you imagine? How sad do you feel for me? Little kindergarten Candace. Uh, I'm going to have to show you a picture of me in kindergarten. I hope I can find one. But little me crying outside, so sad that this girl had hurt my feelings and I was just trying to make some friends. And actually, if you fast forward, the most interesting part of this is that me and that girl who called me ugly then became best friends, and we stayed best friends all the way through to high school. So this little incident was something that we'd go back and laugh at. I don't know, maybe she said it because she wanted to be friends with me and thought I was maybe cool but went the other way and ran. I don't know. I couldn't tell you. And I was thinking about that incident and thinking of how different that would be today, right? Because Amy was white. And if that had ever happened, it would just be an entirely different category. They would say that this little girl didn't know, but she was implicitly racist. She wasn't just trying out or experimenting being mean. She was just implicitly racist. And what I suffered through would be something that I would be able to share over and over again as the first time that I experienced racism. I don't know, maybe under the web of CRT, that experience would be categorized. I was also talking about other elements of my childhood and just what it's like to grow up in a black household, or at least how it was during that time. And parents are tough. Our parents are a lot tougher, I think, than most parents. For example, there's an expression that most black Americans, if you tell them, do you got McDonald's money? They'll know exactly what you are referring to. For whatever reason, in black households, whenever you're growing up and you'd ask your parents for anything, Particularly for whatever reason, we'd say, oh, can we go to McDonald's? And your mom would look at you and say, you got McDonald's money? Okay, no, okay, then we're not going to McDonald's. Can we go to Toys R Us? You got Toys R Us money? Okay, then we aren't going to Toys R Us, right? There's another thing that if you share your feelings, <laughs> which is, it makes me laugh, but it's true. If you say something to your parents, when I was growing up, like, I'm depressed, your mom would say to you, why don't you go depress them dishes? 
right? This is sort of black parenting. They just would insert your emotion and tell you to go do a random chore. So if you were crying about anything, it just gets turned into some chore you need to do, not addressing your underlying sadness. In fact, I think one of the greatest things that my mom used to say to me growing up was when I would get really sad, like really upset, like how could I possibly be made to live in this household? I would say to my mother through tears that I was going to run away. And my mother would always say the same thing back to me. She would say, don't run, walk, save your energy because nobody is coming after you. Ouch, owies, a sick burn. And then of course I would cry even harder. And I'm reimagining that scenario today. Like I can't imagine now that a parent would be allowed to say that to their child without their child maybe opening up to a teacher or someone saying, oh, it's not, it's a horrible way that you are abused. You're being emotionally abused. Your parents should sit you down and discuss why it is that you run away. And these feelings and emotions are valid and your, your parents are doing the wrong thing. I don't know, maybe they'd find a thread on TikTok, right? Maybe they would have to find a thread on TikTok about the emotional abuse and the emotional neglect that you're experiencing. And yet, Despite this, it seems to me that we produced tougher children, right? Even despite the fact that now children are never being more heard or more validated in every emotional experience that they're having, it doesn't seem to be working. We aren't producing stronger children. They're not able to deal with anything in the world. Take a listen to this, because in considering this, I remembered this clip of Louis C.K. You'll, you guys remember Louis C.K. or know Louis C.K. He is a comedian. He got me too so you don't see him around as much as you did a few years ago. Uh, but it's one of my favorite clips of all time. It's him discussing why he doesn't allow his children to have cell phones. Take a listen. Some parents really struggle with, like, all the other kids have the, uh, the terrible things, so my kid has to, yeah, let's let, you know, let your kid go and be a better example to the kids. They, she doesn't, just because the other stupid kids have phones doesn't mean that, okay, well, my kid has to be stupid, otherwise she'll feel weird. Right. You know, I, I think these things are toxic, I don't, especially for kids. It's just this thing, it's bad. And right. they, they don't look at people when they talk to them, and they don't build the empathy. You know, kids are mean, and it's because they're trying it out. They, they look at a kid and they go, you're fat. And then they see the kid's face scrunch up and they go, ooh, that doesn't feel good to make a person do that. Right. But, they, but they gotta start with doing the mean thing. But when they write you're fat, then they just go, mmm, um, that was fun, I like that. <laughs> so, that tasted good. Yeah, exactly, you need, the thing is, I, you need to build an ability to just be yourself and not be doing something. That's what the phones yes. are taking away. Yes. Is the ability to just sit there like this. That's being a person, right? Yes. No one can, they gotta, uh, you gotta check. Because, there, you know, underneath everything in your life, there's that thing, that empty, forever empty. You know what I'm talking about? <laughs> that. Yes. Yes. Yes, I. Yes. Yes, Just I know that, what you're that talking about. knowledge that it's all for nothing and you're alone. You know, it's down there. And sometimes when things clear away, you're not watching it, you're in your car and you start going, oh no, here it comes <laughs> that I'm alone. Like it starts to visit on you. You know, just the sadness. Yes. Life is tremendously sad just by, you know, being in it. And so you're driving and then you go, uh, that's why we text and drive. I look around, pretty much 100% of people driving are texting. Yes. And they're killing, everybody's murdering each other with their cars. Yes. But people are willing to risk taking a life and ruining their own because they don't want to be alone for a second because it's so hard. I was in my car one time and a Bruce Springsteen song comes on. And I heard it, and it gave me kind of like a fall back to school depression feeling. It made me really sad. Yeah. And I go, okay, I'm getting sad. I gotta get the phone and write hi to like 50 people. <laughs> and then, you know, somebody cool writes back, and then somebody not as cool writes after, and I'm like, oh, f you, I'm not gonna. <laughs> I, got somebody, I got somebody better. <laughs> but, uh. Hey, how come you didn't answer my text? <laughs> Speaking of which, yeah, well, yeah, because he well, wrote, he yeah. wrote first. That's right. <laughs> so, anyway, I started to get that sad feeling, and I was reaching for the phone. Then I said, "You know what? Don't just be sad. Just let the sad just stand in the way of it, and let it hit you like a truck." <laughs> and I let it come, and Bruce, and I just started to feel, "Oh my God!" 
And I pulled over and I just cried like a bitch. I cried so much. And, I, and it was beautiful. It was like this beautiful, it's just this, sadness is poetic. You're, you're lucky to live sad moments. And then I had happy feelings because because when you let yourself feel sad, yes. your body has like antibodies. It has happiness that comes. Rushing in. Rushing in to meet the sadness. So you're, I was grateful to feel sad. And then I met it with true profound happiness. It was such a trip, you know, and the thing is, because we don't want that first bit of sad, yeah. we push it away with like a little phone or <laughs> for the food, <laughs> and you get, you get a little kind of, you never feel completely sad or completely happy. Right. You just feel kind of satisfied with your product. Yes. And then you die. <laughs> so that's why I don't want to get a phone for my kid. I love, love, love that clip so much because I do think it speaks to this generation so much. I think that it is why people believe that we are facing this mental health crisis every time a child has a feeling. I think despite the fact that they have so many feelings, what it really comes down to is they are overwhelmed by having an authentic feeling. They somehow think that they are not required to ever be sad. Social media is depriving them of that. There is, it's depriving them of becoming experienced with natural emotions. And so when they feel a natural emotion, they become super anxious and they feel like they're having a breakdown because even as parents, we are not allowing children to realize that sadness is a part of life, right? Not every single feeling that you have is so legitimate that it needs to be discussed for hours and hours and hours. And this is sort of being reinforced by the education system, which is almost over-validating the feelings that mean nothing, right? And at the same time, telling children that if they want to, they can turn to their technologies, they can turn to TikTok to suspend emotions, right? There's almost this juxtaposition that's happening. And so I think that um, a resolution to this, and this goes back to my grandfather's generation, and fortunately my generation, where we didn't have all of these social media apps, is that we need to have tougher parents. We need to have less people experiencing things on social media and instead experiencing things in the real world. And really that's all that I have to say about that. All right, guys, before we continue, I want to talk to you about Bond Charge. Formerly called Blue Blocks, they have rebranded and are now called Bond Charge, and they're a holistic wellness brand with a huge range of products aimed at helping you sleep better, perform better, have more energy, recover faster, balance hormones, and reduce inflammation. My favorite product from Bond Charge is their computer glasses. I'm on my phone and computer a lot during the day, reading emails and doing research. I used to get really bad headaches from staring at screens all day. And then I tried their computer glasses and they totally solved my problem of digital eye strain. They are pricier than other brands, but I think the investment is 100% worth it. And here's why. They are made in optics laboratories, not mass produced in factories. They use science-backed technology that is tested to ensure they actually work. Their frames are really beautiful and have even been featured in GQ and Vogue. Their glasses come in non-prescription, prescription, and reading options, and they have a wide variety of glasses for every need. So go to bondcharge.com slash Candice and use coupon code Candice to save 20% off your purchase. That's B-O-N-C-H-A-R-G-E dot com slash Candice and use coupon code Candice to save 20%. Okay, now it's time for some topics de jour. Okay, so Kanye West, who now goes by Ye West, of course, you guys, unless you've been hiding under a rock, know the story. He and I in Paris at his Yeezy fashion show wore t-shirts that said White Lives Matter and broke the internet. Actually, the morning after when I saw him, he said, should we respond to it? I actually were thinking that we should just say nothing about it and just appreciate the art of the response, right? He is, among other things, a fashion designer and an artist. And so it was fun to really appreciate that the response was the art. The response that we knew we were going to get was a commentary on society, of course, because for years we were told 
that saying Black Lives Matter was not divisive, saying Black Lives Matter was not a form of black supremacy, saying Black Lives Matter was a righteous thing to say. People were, of course, then okay with people that said Asian Lives Matter because, of course, this (laughs) phrase is not divisive. You can just insert any except for white. I don't know what happened there. But those same individuals completely flipped. Suddenly it became an expression of white supremacy. It was not inclusive at all. It wasn't saying anything. It needed to go. And I was comfortable to just allow people to scream and to shout and to appreciate the art in it. Uh, But then Kanye decided that it was time to say something because he's not just an artist, right? He is more than that. He has always been more than just an artist and a rapper and a producer and a fashion designer. And he went on Tucker Carlson last night. Now, you remember that everyone's been telling you that he's completely insane, that he just does things, that there's no thought behind it. And you, if you watched this segment on Tucker Carlson, got a very different version of Ye West. Take a listen. So you just came from Paris Fashion Week. You just landed. And you have a lanyard and still on from it. And there's a photograph on it. What is that? It's a photograph of a baby's ultrasound. Why is that? And that you designed that? Yes. Why? What does that mean? Uh, it just represents life. I'm pro-life. Boy, so you wear it on a badge. What, what kind of response do you get? And, and good, amen. I agree. I don't care about people's responses. I care about the fact that there's more black babies being aborted than born in New York City at this point. That 50% of black death in America is abortion. So I really don't care about people's responses. I perform for an audience of one, and that's God. Yeah, that my favorite response, because I kept on thinking, like, you know, people, they're looking for an explanation, and people say, well, as an artist, you don't have to give an explanation, but as a leader, you do. Yes, I think that's right. So the answer to why I wrote White Lives Matter on a shirt is because they do. It's the obvious thing. Amazing, incredibly measured and profound. And it's profound in its simplicity, right? They do. It is true. White lives matter, black lives matter, Asian lives matter, all lives matter. And unfortunately, we live in a society that is unwilling to admit that it is a form of racism when you're only angry when you say white lives matter, right? You, it, it is such a strange time to live in that people think that they are legitimate in treating white people as if they're not allowed to speak in society anymore. And how profound and how measured is he in wearing this lanyard and speaking to under this understanding that what we do matters only to God, right? And what is happening in black America is a form of genocide. What is happening in terms of the abortion industry and its deep history uh, related to eugenics and Margaret Sanger and Planned Parenthood actually targeting black families. What is happening is unacceptable. It is such a cultural moment that he has the courage to go on Tucker Carlson and to hold the line and not to completely collapse because people on the left are basically demanding that he become silenced. They no longer want him. The people in fashion, we covered this yesterday, Gigi Hadid, the big models are basically saying he needs to go, he's just a bully. People were completely silent, right, about the fact that people are describing as mentally ill. Imagine describing a black man who has the courage to speak out on the death industry that is abortion as just somebody that's mentally ill and disturbed, right? That's not a form of racism. But they've remained silent on those topics, and they only want to speak out because he wore a T-shirt that says, White Lives Matter. Really, really think about what that says about the state of things in America. Moving on, it is, I I actually can't even believe what I'm about to share with you. It's incredible. If you want to talk about black America in the context of what Democrats believe to be true about black America, we are emotional, silly putty. We are thoughtless. We are stupid. And we are undeserving of a conversation. Uh, They do not believe that we possess even a modicum of intelligence, which is why every time it is around election season, they go out to rappers. That's what they do. They go out to rappers and they basically say, can you make a video or do an interview and just tell the millions of other stupid people that follow you to vote and to do as we say? This is what they do, right? Notoriously, Cardi B, Joe Biden gave 
essentially no interviews when he was running in 2020 using COVID as an excuse. But he did step out and do an interview with Cardi B, and it was a mockery. There was there were no intelligent questions being asked of him, but she had a huge following. Well, it's midterm season, and they've gone out again to hip-hop artists, this time Trina and an artist known as Saucy Santana, and they have asked them to produce this video, uh, a music video a song that's called No Voting, No Vucking. Vucking spelled V-U-C-K-I-N-G. But of course, you know what it's supposed to mean. The lyrics are essentially about how if you don't vote, you're not going to be able to have sex. Uh, Take a listen. (laughs) Trey checks, I think we got one. It's voting season, bruh. No voting, no loving. No voting, no touching. No voting, no nothing. No voting, no fucking. No voting, no fucking. No voting, no loving. No voting, no touching. No voting, no nothing. No voting, no fucking. No voting, no fucking. BLK app looking for some action. Why the homie Scott was heading? Faces a nine, abs a ten, D is a mm, to be determined. He got mad jokes. He don't seem broke. The only red flag. Okay, okay, okay. So in case you missed the lyrics there, they're on an app looking to have sex. The lyrics are, BLK app looking for some action. Swipe the homie Scott. What's happening? Space is a nine. Abs is a ten. His D is a mm to be determined. He got mad jokes. He don't seem broke. The only red flag is he said he don't vote. This midterm is for all the single cuties. Want to hit this booty? Got to do your civic duty. No voting, no bucking. This is uh, the explicit version that, I'm, version that I'm looking at right now. And the second verse goes on to say, don't stop now. Stuff my ballot box again. Brought my homegirl through. Put the bi in partisan. Oh, okay, I guess we're talking about bisexual sex now. Politics be so nasty, make me want to flirt. You show you how to be a poll worker. Here's my, I think, this is the best part here. It goes on to say, legs in the air, I don't care. Anyone can get it, universal health care. Oh, Okay, well, I guess promiscuity promiscuity is great. You're just, I guess you have to, if you want to be a slut, you got to vote. That's the message here. Goes on to say, if you want to come before the deadline, come in this jacuzzi, gerrymander this coochie. <laughs> I guess I, I have to laugh because if I wasn't laughing, I'd be crying. I mean, it's just, yeah, gerrymander this coochie. How's that, Black America? Yeah, we, we're doing this because we're being inclusive, not because we think you are so stupid that this is the only thing you'll respond to. We can't, of course, we can't just go to Black people and say, hey, you should vote because it's your civic duty and it's incredibly important that you vote because the people that you put into office are going to determine the future for you. They're going to be controlling your tax dollars and they're going to be determining the future for your children. No, 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 no. Black Americans are too stupid for that. Give them no voting, no bucking, and tell them that they should, if they don't vote, then they're not going to be able to have promiscuous sex on the BLK app, and God forbid their coochies are not gerrymandered. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know what to say to that. Um, I don't know why Black America is still not awake to the fact that we are considered stupid. Uh, We are considered the dumbest race in America. We are considered emotional silly putty. They are laughing at us. And they are using people that they laugh at to make us do even more ridiculous things, to make us do their bidding. I don't know why Black America still can't see that, but I'll keep reporting on it in the hopes that one day we might. Moving on from that, I've got to discuss this mayor in New Orleans. I I love this mayor in a way. I don't know. I think she's just, (laughs) she's amazingly audacious. She's a Democrat mayor, of course. It's an inner city community. And she recently got caught spending a lot of money, $30,000 actually on some flights. And those flights were not an economy. They were first class tickets to France and to Switzerland. 
And they said, this is ridiculous. You can't spend this kind of money, Mayor LaToya Cantrell. And actually, she said that she could. And the reason that she could is because um, it would be unsafe for black people to fly in economy. <laughs> I, mean, I don't know. Take a listen to what else she said. Uh, all expenses incurred doing business on behalf of the city of New Orleans will not be reimbursed to the city of New Orleans. One thing is clear, I do my job and I will continue to do it with distinction, with dignity and integrity every step of the way. And so that's what I have to say on that. And so that's what she has to say on that. And one thing is clear, right? One thing is clear. Economy class flights are just not safe for black women. And so she flew herself in first class, okay? <laughs> she did because it's unsafe. You know, their food is not that good in economy, okay? It's just not. And it is unsafe for us to consume a meal that is not more safe in first class. I actually love this policy. I'm gonna run that up to the Daily Wire. Um, I do think that they should be paying for me to fly in first class all the time because I'm black and it is unsafe. It is unsafe for me to fly anywhere else. A uh, quick update to that story. Actually, it turns out she's going to have to reimburse the city because they don't really care about this ridiculous notion that she's not safe. And it just was not legal for her to be purchasing those flights. They have policies. On top of that, if you think that's audacious, they have also found that she is staying in a property, a luxurious apartment that is owned by the city. She's just been staying there. She just decided to allow herself in there. She's not allowed to be living there, but she likes the digs better um, at this flat that is owned by the city. And so now they're investigating her for that. And I'm sure that she will end up having to potentially recompensate them for staying there illegally. And I'm sure that she will say, um, excuse me, her health and her safety is being disregarded. She would rather stay in luxurious digs because staying in our own homes is unsafe. Yeah. How about that, you guys? We're unsafe. It's hard out there for black people. Uh, moving on and in this topic and uh, in this furthering conversation that we are having about black America and all the frauds that exist in black America, all the people that keep extracting these various notions like this Mayor Latoya Contrell, that black Americans are suffering and therefore we should, you should, should not look any further, right? Don't look, don't dig beneath the surface at all. Just listen to us tell you BS. Listen to us say, as we did during the Black Lives Matter campaign, that you should just accept us rioting and looting and burning down our own communities, by the way. This is where we live. Accept it, look the other way. Don't call it criminality because I don't know, we're, we're suffering in some regard. Well, as you guys know, and you may have seen online, I have just dropped the documentary to uh, the doc documentary trailer, pardon, uh, to my Black Lives Matter documentary, which is entitled George Floyd, The Greatest Lie Ever Sold. And in case you haven't seen it, I am going to share it with you right now. So Black Lives Matter released their 990 IRS filings. They collected $80 million. Where is that money? It's not here. Everything looks worse than it was. Where have you seen that money impacted throughout the city? <laughs> so my producer just sent me a link. It is just shocking to me because of how much money was raised to think that where he lived, the bills weren't being covered. Super frustrating, but that's a dead end, so. And here's where it gets really interesting. Ready for some BLM pride? Another 200K went to escorts, BDSM workers, strippers, peep show workers, phone sex operators, and webcam performers. And then at that moment, it became personal. And I thought, not only am I going to say the truth, <laughs> I am going to scream the truth louder than you can scream the lies. I am going to scream the truth louder than they can scream the lies because I am just annoyed that people think we're gonna move on from that entire scenario. I am beyond excited to bring you guys this documentary. It was something that I actually brought to the Daily Wire. I sat down and I said, I wanna do this. I 
want to look into this obvious scam. And it is a scam in the way that it has divided America. It is a scam in the way that it has silenced white Americans. It is a scam in the way that it has promoted criminality and harmed black communities. And so, nope, I am not going to let it go. Please, you guys, if you haven't yet, uh, get ready to watch that documentary. It's dropping October 12th, next Wednesday. And I am just asking everyone to respectfully wear black when you watch it because it's going to be Black Lives Matter's funeral. And that's all I have to say about that. All right, guys, next portion of the show is going to be available exclusively on Daily Wire Plus. I'm going to be talking about Biden pardoning all prior federal offenses of simple marijuana possession. So if you are not a member yet, go ahead and click the link in the description and subscribe right now.